Sunday morning to be able to come to your house and praise and worship you. We just thank you that as we sing songs to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, your presence is going to rest on us this morning. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for having your way in throughout the service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Get the lights, you can up in this road. Just raise your hands and one of you just sit in the kitchen. Welcome each one of y'all here this morning. And I hope y'all are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Really, it's really concerned about your health. 
So, uh, y'all can come on up. Does anybody else have anything else? Because I want to turn this over to Dusty and let him get the word in us, because I feel like we all need that word this morning. Amen. Amen. Um, are you done? Come on, Michelle. You done, Michelle? You done, Michelle? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good So this month, as I was planning, I was going back, I have a bunch of scriptures always, but I was going through a lot of different scriptures, trying to see like how what I wanted to put together. I had one thing planned out, and I got all the way to the end, and Jesus, Holy Spirit told me, you're wrong. What you're trying to say is not right. So then I had to research it more. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about this morning is the uh, a couple of the Marys in the New Testament. 
because everybody thinks that Mary Magdalene was the le- was the woman who was a prostitute. She was the woman who cleaned Jesus' feet. She was the woman at the cross, at the tomb, and everything. And there was multiple Marys. It wasn't the same woman. This whole time, I thought it was the same Mary. I thought Mary was the sister of Lazarus. She was the Mary Magdalene who was at the cross. I thought it was all the same. But it's not the same woman. Mary was just a I would say I wouldn't say a common name back then, but it's a commonly translated name because we know that the, the word's been translated. And you know, in the sixteen hundreds with the King James Version and all that, they translated names and Mary's what they put to a lot of people. But the main theme with all of these Marys, including I mean you can even talk about the Mary, the mother of Jesus, is how much they understood how much Jesus really loved them. And that's what we have to understand every day is how much does he really love us in every situation? Sure, you have tests and you have trials, you have things that come, you have things that go. But whenever you really understand how deep, how wide his love is for you, nothing matters. You know, you can think of sad things that happen in your life. But when you get a chance to step into heaven, when we get a chance to transition, it's not going to matter if it happens to me in a minute or if it happens to me when I'm 80. I'm never going to want to come back. No, you mind. I ain't never going to want to come back here. That's right. There ain't no, nothing I could get in this world that I could take up to heaven and try and bring back Robert, try and bring back Mr. Philip, try and bring back Junior, try and bring back other people who've passed in my life. None of them, if they're up in heaven, would, would remotely care about anything here. And that's why Jesus always said, I'm about my father's business. Because he knew he was on a mission. And and we get in our head that, why is this happening to me? Why is this going on? Why do these things happen? And we try and put it on God. But how, how can we do that when his word clearly states that he gave everything for us? And we always separate the two. We try to separate, well, Jesus, we have a picture of Jesus in our head that he always loves us. But then when we switch to God, we think, oh, he's going to get me. Or, you know, that's the big bad dad. And I did something wrong. That's gonna... But that's not the case. They're the same. They have the same personality. They do the same things because Jesus did what the Father did. And God literally knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin when he created them. Because he knew everything. But yet he loved us enough to know, I'm going to create these people. They're going to sin. And then I'm going to create something else. To bring them back. And I'm going to give up everything that I have in heaven that I love to these people because I love them. Amen. And when you fully understand that, this stuff doesn't matter. That's whenever healing comes. That's whenever things in your life start changing. Amen. Stuff happening is because you really love people. That's when you want to tell people about God, about Jesus, and get them saved because he's really changed you on the inside. To understand that there's not a human on this planet who can love you as much as he can. And looking through these stories, you just get to see how much they realized and reveled in how much he loves us. And we always focus because the the Bible was written uh, mainly from a man's perspective, you know. But it's funny to see how many of these women are mentioned, and not many of them are mentioned in the New Testament. But Mary Magdalene's mentioned 12 times in the New Testament, and the only thing that you can go and find out about her is that she was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And that's all that matters. That's what I want to be known as. So you got to study the heart of people to realize what you you know where you want to be. It's not a coincidence that probably more women go to this church than men. Why? Because when Jesus does something, it's the same thing as in a relationship. When a woman falls in love with a man, and she really falls in love with him, she's going to let a lot of stuff go with that man. And it's going to take a long time before she finally says, "I'm leaving." Right? He's going to have to do a lot of things before he says that. And it's the same thing if a man really loves a woman. But with the heart of a woman, how she clings on to that person, you can see how Mary really clings on to Jesus. And that's a strength of faith. Because in everything that happened, no matter what came against her, she still clinged on to that situation. And that's how you got to live, and that's how you got to live by faith, in how much he loves you. Because he just does, even when you don't think it. When I sat there and I watched people pass in my life, I didn't feel in that moment that Jesus really loved me as much as he does. 
But looking back on it, I can see that he really loved me in those situations. Um, I mean, I know we have, you know, the situation with going on with David right now. And the first thing that the devil hit in my mind was, I ain't ready for this again. Right? I'm not ready to go see somebody strapped up that I love and all this other stuff. I'm not, I'm not physically, emotionally, I'm not, I'm not there. And I had to battle that. You know, even you know, while I was driving, I had to battle that in my mind. I don't I don't really want to go, I don't really want to do that. And the Holy Spirit said, Well, you are, and I was like, All right, I am. That's just how I am. You know, that's just that's just how I am. He, if he tells me that I'm gonna do it, he's gonna be the one to strengthen me because he says in the Bible in the word that when you're at your weakest, the victory's his. Amen. When you're at your, your least strength, He's still in the victory. Amen. And no matter what you can think in your life, that could be the worst thing to happen to you. He's still who he said he is, and he still loves you. Amen. Yes. And nothing can change your mind or should be able to change your mind about that. Amen. So as I read, I was like, well, Lord, I said, who do I need to look at? And it was interesting to me because you don't really, you know, not a lot of people focus on women in the Bible. Amen. I've never seen many people focus. They focus on Mary, the mother of Jesus, but they don't focus on the other ones. And when you study out, especially Mary Magdalene, and I'm going to show you in the scriptures, she was the only person that it says in the scripture that got to see Jesus as soon as he was risen before he went to heaven. It doesn't say there's anybody else in the word. We can't point to anybody that got to see him in his not glorified self going back to heaven and coming back down. So she saw him as soon as he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So he must, the Lord, the God, everybody must have knew that she was really sold out. It wasn't John who they said that he loved. It wasn't James, his brother. It wasn't these people, Peter. It wasn't any of those. It was just a woman who was constantly there serving and giving to Jesus throughout her life. The least of these to the most of these. And she didn't even brag about seeing him. She just wanted to run and tell everybody else that I, that he's risen. Amen. I just want y'all to know. And then they still didn't believe her. Why? Because she was a woman. Why would Jesus come back and go to her? Probably they had those thoughts. You know, why would he come and see me? Why did she get to see him first? You know, stuff like that. And she didn't care. So we're going to start out in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And this is kind of where you first see uh, Mary come up in the Bible and it says after this Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him so this is already after these picked the twelve disciples and also some women were with him too so everybody talks about the twelve disciples but in the Bible it tells us that women were following as well so you always think about Jesus and the twelve but there were some women there who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Not yet, seriously. Whom seven demons had came out. So Mary Magdalene was just somebody who was tormented by devils that Jesus had passed and delivered her from seven demons. And then it says, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, whoever that is, probably not Chusa, Susa, whatever, however you want to say it, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. So right there, if you have any thoughts in your mind about, should I give to the church? They was given to Jesus, and the women were doing it before the men. The men went there. The women loved him so much, they said, I'm not only going to follow you, I'm also going to go ahead and start tithing to you. Amen. I'm also going to go ahead and start cooking you meals. I'm going to follow around so that way you can have somebody to take care of you while you take care of your mission and the gospel. Amen. Thank God. I find that very interesting because a lot of people want to talk about different things, but the first thing that they did that they point out in the Bible was that they started giving them stuff out of their own means to help them out. But why did they do that? They didn't do it because they was thinking about anything else. They just did it because they loved him, because he loved them first. Yes. No. I mean, I've had some problems in my life, but I ain't never been tormented by seven demons. 
Have y'all ever experienced that? Seen that? No, I, I ain't never had that happen. I've had some little things, and most I, I would bet that 95% of the problems in my life was probably because of my flesh. Things that I just wanted to do. Things that I wanted to think. Things that I wanted to kind of play around with. Um, but these are women that really got delivered. And the first thing they do is want to follow, help in just any way they can just to support Jesus out of their own means and do their do, do whatever they can to kind of help him. So now we go from Luke chapter 8 down to Luke chapter, or not Luke, sorry, John chapter 20, and we'll go 1 through 18. So John 20, 1 through 18, and now we kind of flash forward to Mary Magdalene getting to see Jesus. So this is after Jesus has been crucified, and this is after he had been buried and put in the tomb. And it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw what the stone, that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So she ran, saw that it had been moved away because she had been sitting there. And then she finally went back, you know, rested and came back. And then the tomb's gone. So she's worried that somebody's taken the body of Jesus because they were supposed to be on guard so nobody could steal it and everything. So she ran to Peter and John to tell them. And it says, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I always find this funny. I feel like that's John making jokes that Peter might have been a little overweight and he's faster than him. Why does he have to let everybody know I got there before you? But he put in there, you know, we ran, but I beat him, everybody. And so he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. So John looks, and he's just looking, you know, because he hung on everything that Jesus said, and he's looking just to see, is the clothing still in there? You know, is he risen? Because it, it wasn't going to take a lot for John to be, you know, convinced. So he said, then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. But then you have Peter, who's of a different mindset. And we know he's crazy. And he's trying, because he's the one who cut the centurion's ear. And he just had to get in there. He was probably going, you know, bear hug style. You know, everybody has a different thing. I look at this a little bit, kind of how I would look at me and Robert. If we were running after Jesus, Robert would have definitely been Peter. Robert would have been the one to cut the ear off. Robert would have been the one to run into the tomb. He would have jumped on top of him and everything else. I would have been a little more timid. I would have definitely been, I wouldn't have beat him in a race. Um, but I would have been more timid. I would have kind of looked and, you know, waited behind and, and waited for my turn. But Peter, that's just his personality. He ran in there. He saw the strips of linen laying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. So he sees that all this stuff's kind of separated, and it's lying where it is. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, and then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So they didn't understand that he had to rise again, because this, this hadn't been writ written really in the Scriptures. It just said that, you know, there'd be a virgin, he'd die, and then you'd have a way to get into heaven. Even though he told them, you know, by mouth, I'm going to come back in three days, it hadn't registered. But I find it funny that people talk about Peter, how he denied Jesus before Jesus was crucified, but he's so fast back into Jesus, he's running straight to him when he thinks he's there. And that's how our mindset has to be. We can have a time where we go away from him, we might say something, we might sin. But you got to have that heart to jump right back in him, and he's one of the first three people trying to see Jesus when he comes back. What's he trying to do? He's probably trying to ask him to forgive him, but he's there. He's ready. He's not waiting around. He's not trying to hide in the sin. He's trying to get to Jesus as fast as he can. And then here's where it goes, where Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene in the next few scriptures. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. So you see her, she's full heart and emotions. John and Peter run in. They're just checking everything out. They don't say anything about crying. She's weeping. You know, she's she's very emotional. She's thinking that somebody's stolen, you know, her Savior, her Lord, who saved her and delivered her. And then she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. 
one at the head and the other at the foot. Isn't it funny that she stayed there in her sorrow of how much she loved Jesus and God showed up? In her most weakest time where she thought somebody had stolen who she loved the most, who she gave her whole life to, God shows up. John and Peter left before the Lord showed up. They could have saw the angel sitting there. But they ran in there thinking with their mind, is Jesus here? Is he not there? You know, John believed he ran off. But Mary's sitting there. She starts weeping. And then she sees the angels because he says in the Bible, when you're at your weakest, he's there with you as well. So Jesus knew, God knew that he had to sit there and comfort Mary in that time. Because that was her time of need. And she needed to know something. And then they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she said, they've taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they've put him. So she doesn't even care. She doesn't care. She thought they just stole his body and took it somewhere and it's not going to sit in the tomb. So she's most worried there. And at this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not even realize that it was Jesus. So she's the first one to see Jesus get rose from the dead. And it was in her weakness whenever he came and showed up. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? And who is it that you were looking for? So not only does she not recognize him, she doesn't recognize his voice here either. And he, thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, just tell me where you put him and I will get him. This is just one woman. She says, I'll figure out how to pull this 200-something pound body back in the tomb. I'll wrap him up. I'll get him. I'll, I'll make sure he looks the way I want him to look. Right? If if my mom could, she would have picked up Robert and carried him over there. But let me tell you, dead weight is the heaviest weight I have ever picked up in my life. And I, you wouldn't think it, but that was that was the heaviest weight. Moving somebody who's, you know, lifeless is not something that's easy. But she said, if you figure it out, I'll figure out a way to get him back here. Just tell me where you put him. And Jesus then said to her, Mary. And all he had to do was call her name. And she turned around and cried out in Aramaic. Rabbi, which means teacher. And Jesus, so she said that, ran up to him, hugged him, because Jesus says, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. So before he even gets to go to heaven, because she waited, and because she just kind of just went with her emotions and her just blind faith of crying sitting at this tomb, she gets to see him even before he goes to heaven. I mean, sometimes you just have to wait on the Lord. <laughs> it's a perfect thing. You just have to wait in that. Long if it gets time. weird, if it gets awkward, if you if you're in your emotions, sometimes you gotta cry. Sometimes you're gonna be excited. Sometimes that. But no matter what feelings you are, you're on the brink of something happening if you just wait. And he said, "Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God." I'm and Mary good. Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, and she said, "I have seen the Lord." And she told them what he had said, the, that uh, that he had said these things to her. So she went and told them immediately that I've seen him already. He's risen and he's going to heaven and he's coming back. Amen. So she gets the one to tell the good news, the first one. First person to say he's risen is Mary Magdalene. And all she did was get delivered by seven demons and then help her out with all the means she had throughout his whole ministry. She was just supporting, loving, listening and being a follower of Jesus. And that's all you can find about her. It's just how much she, she loved Jesus and how much uh, she, she followed him throughout the scripture. Now going to another Mary, if you go to John 11, verses 1, or starting in verse 1, John 11, verse 1. This is Mary, who's the sister of Lazarus. And you should be a little familiar with Lazarus. He died, got rose again by Jesus. Um, but this is kind of the whole account here of what happens. And in verse 1 it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And we'll see about that in another scripture. It says, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So obviously Jesus loved this family because they sent and said, somebody who you really love is sick, Lord. And they didn't just send it thinking that he was just had a cold. No, they knew he was going to die. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death, 
No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So the first thing he said was he's not going to die. But as you see, the story goes on. He passes away in the natural, and they didn't really cling to what Jesus said. But Jesus said he wasn't going to die, so he's not going to die. He didn't care what the prognosis was. He didn't care what kind of sickness it was. All <laughs> Jesus heard was that God told him he ain't going to die, so Jesus said, this is for me to be glorified, and he's not going to die. And he's not, Jesus didn't really move until we get a little further down in this passage. And it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. I found this funny when I was reading it. So he loved them a lot, but then he didn't go see them. He waits two days, and he talks about how he loved them so much, but then he doesn't go to them, right? It doesn't make sense in the natural. And so, like, while I was studying that, I was like, well, I was like, what is that? Why would, he, why would he wait for two days? And I think, and this you can't find in the scripture, but I think when you love somebody and you're going to go and you're going to see them in a state, you got to get yourself prepared before you see that person. You know, I remember driving down to Robert's wedding, and we got there, and when he showed up, I was sitting by my mom. Who was more affected by the way he looked physically? My mom was. <laughs> You know, she was like trying to break down and, and cry because he, I mean, he was on, that was the first time that he looked like he was on the brink of death, was when we were going down there and he was trying to get married. I mean, his, his legs were as big as his head, and his head was huge at the end. I hope Jesus just let him hear me say that about him. <laughs> <laughs> he, had a big, he, he always had a big head. But, I mean, they were, they were big, and then, and then she started crying. And I wasn't really paying attention to her, but the Holy Spirit said, don't consider the physical senses. And I looked to her and I said, we, we can't consider what physical senses. That's right. If we're believing for a miracle, you can't consider what it looks like. Because it looks like he's going to walk down this aisle and fall over and die. I mean, that's that's how bad he was. Um, I mean, most of y'all saw him that last Sunday. It just didn't, I mean, it looked like it had sucked everything out of him that he, that he had. Um, so... I think the Lord was preparing Jesus that you're going into a situation because you love these people in your flesh and spiritually that could pull on your heartstrings. And if you focus on what you feel, sometimes God can't get through your feelings to do what he needs to do. So sometimes you have to prepare yourself, and the Lord has to prepare yourself to see certain situations. And then after two days, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. And then they start saying, but Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you were going back. So they tried to kill him there, and they're like, why would you want to go back? We just got out of there. And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. So he had a mission. If God told him, after those two days, going back, he knew I was going to get to Lazarus. This was going to happen because he just really believed what Jesus told him, or what God told him. <clears throat> and then his disciples replied to him, even after that, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. And Jesus was not speaking about sleeping in this situation. He was talking about he already knew he died. So God not only was getting Jesus ready, but he had to wait him and hold him there so that way he's good and dead. Because, that, I mean, he, he needed Jesus. He didn't need Jesus to come in at the end and pray for him because they had already seen him heal the sick, heal the blind man. That wasn't going to build their faith. They ain't never seen anybody get raised from the, from the grave who had already been in there. So God was setting them up saying, let him get good and gone. And they wrap him up and everything. So that way, by the time Jesus gets there, because it take, probably took him a day or two to walk there. Um, I mean, they didn't really have much. They just had sandals. They'll never really talk about Jesus riding anything except for a donkey at one point. So that boy was walking. Man, if you want to call him a man, sorry. <laughs> but he was speaking of his desk death, but his disciples thought that he just meant natural sleep. And so then he told them plainly. He saw that they just thought he was taking a nap. Well, he's going to get better, God. Why do we have to walk over there? They're trying to kill us. 
You know, and this is probably, uh, I would think, if I thought off the top of my head, Peter might have said this, you know, based on what you know, and then, you know, Judas definitely. Judas is like, I'm starting to make some cash, Lord. We don't need to go back and kill kill my buyer, you know, because mm-hmm. he's stealing from him, even though Jesus knows it. And he's like, I need this to be profitable. Why are we going back there? Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy to know who would say so. And then also you have... Thomas is going to pipe up, too, because Doubt and Thomas is kind of one of the ones you have. So you have all these people, you know, saying stuff. And he says, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So he's saying, I'm glad that you aren't there to see him die, because if I had got him before he died, then you wouldn't believe me more. Because they need to see a new type of miracle. <laughs> and then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we, we may die with him. So Thomas already saying, we know we're going to get killed, but if we're going to die, we might as well do it with Jesus, guys. I want to make sure I'm in the best place possible when I die so that way I can go to this place of heaven. Right? That's what Thomas is saying. He's like, I'm not staying over here because if this turns out not to be true, I don't want to be over here without him. He just was like, at least he had that. I want to stay close to Jesus, and if he dies, I die. You know, that just is what it is. So Jesus gets there, and this is when he starts comforting the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. So four days, and I always teach this when I talk about it. This is this is before embalming. This is just a body that's been dead for four days. It's in the Middle East. It's hot. They're wrapped up, wrapped up the body, so he, so Lazarus is in an extra oven, you know, it's, it's cooking right there. Skin probably stinks, you know, horribly, because even Mary, you know, Martha or Mary down here talks about, Lord, he stinketh, and he smells bad, God. I don't know if you've ever been around a dead body, but he stinks <laughs> at this point. So at, when Jesus arrives, they have no hope. They're at the lowest that they are at that they could possibly be in this situation. So they're in their weakness, and here comes the Lord. Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary, the Jews that were trying to stone him, to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So even in that moment, a lot of people give Martha a bad rap because she says, if, you, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. But then she goes on to stretch out just a little bit of faith. So even though they had known that Lazarus would, would had died, she was holding on to the first thing he told her in the scriptures that, He's not, this isn't going to end in death. But she comes and says, hey, Jesus, he did die. But, you know, I know that if you ask anything, then, then this situation could get changed. So <laughs> Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, thinking in her own mind, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. So she's like, I know I'll see him again one day. That's not, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. So this was him showing her, I'm not only who you see right now, I'm somebody who has power over this life and everything supernatural, death, anything you can think of. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? So then he says what he says, and he's all he needs to know is, Mary, do you still believe that I am who I say I am? And her first reply was, yes, Lord. She didn't have any doubt in Tom saying, you know, well, let's go out and get martyred or anything like that. She just said yes. And sometimes that's all we need to say is yes. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside And she said, the teacher is here, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, 
they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. So these people, you know, at a funeral, if you've ever been to one, and it definitely everybody, anybody in your family, you know those people who you never talk to? I was like hanging around you. People who you never see, they want to know, well, what, what, what are they talking about? Let me act like I love them. Let's get a picture for Facebook. You know, all those other stuff now. <clears throat> Let's see if by some miracle that person had a little money and they put me in their will or whatever, you know. But there's always these people who sit around and try and get close and try and, you know, I don't know, it's kind of like leeches. They try to suck on the depression and everything mm -hmm. to make themselves feel like they're, they're something. Mm -hmm. So they follow her because they think she's going to mourn there. We have to look good in society and people have to know that I, I went with my sister Mary to go out there and hold her hand while she cried. You know, whatever they talked about in that time. But when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. And said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So hers isn't as strong as Martha's. Mary's like, he's dead, he's gone. She's the mourning sister. She's the one hard on her sleeve. Reminds me a little bit of my sister, right? She's gone. She fell down. All hope she had is gone. She's at his feet. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. So Jesus sees that they're weeping, and he gets deeply moved in spirit, and he gets troubled. Why is Jesus upset in this moment? Because he does, he, they're not holding to what he told them. So he's, he's moved, one, he does love them. He does love Mary. He doesn't like seeing Mary in pain. But also, she's missing the boat of what he said, that Lazarus isn't going to die. So instead of waiting around, Jesus just says, where have you laid him? And then they said, come and see, Lord. And then Jesus wept. So Jesus is crying because they're not believing who he was, what he said he was going to do. And he's probably a little bit emotionally charged because these are people that he loved in this situation. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So also they have doubt kind of creeping apart. They're saying he loved him so much, but he's done all these miracles, but he can't even keep his friend from dying. You know, that happens a lot. <clears throat> There's probably people who came to this church and probably say some things about Robert passing away. You know, I've done all this stuff for church and your son still dies. You know, there's probably all this stuff, or your brother still dies, all this stuff you do. But there's always going to be people like that. There's people like that with Jesus. And Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. So right here, he's deeply moved. So this is showing you the love of the Father in your situation. When you pray for somebody, you need to have that sort of compassion that Jesus has for people when he prays for them. You know, he, he's deeply moved. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance, entrance, and he says, take away the stone. And then this is where Martha comes in. But Lord, the sister of the dead man... By this time, there's a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. So she's saying, he stinks. It's bad. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, we ain't never opened the tomb, but it can't be good um, if you open this. I mean, think about that. You're going in a cave. It's a tomb. It's been locked shut with a rock. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, think about whenever you put some chicken you cut off in the trash can and you open it the next day, how bad that smells. It's not good. <laughs> Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So he's immediately coming back with the word. That's what we have to come back with is what, the, what does the word say in the situation? What does he promise you? So they took away the stone and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud, loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So not only did Lazarus have to get up, he had to hop out of that cave. <laughs> Boy, it was still wrapped up. What? So Jesus and God, they're showmen. They didn't want the, the Jews who had just showed up at the end trying to get close to Mary. They, he didn't want them to think that they were playing around. That's right. 
So God knew he has to hop out of this thing completely wrapped up like he could have done it himself. You ever try when you're a kid and you're playing hide and seek and you wrap yourself up in a blanket and it look, you know, they got a foot hanging out here or it looks like they wrap themselves up. But you ever have your siblings wrap you up and you can't get out? That's terrifying. Because I had that happen to me. You know, I'd go in there and we'd play hide and seek and that was the last time I can't remember which one it was either Sabrina or Robert. I asked to wrap me up so they couldn't hide. They couldn't find me. Thought I was gonna thought that was it. I was I was praying my last prayers of the Lord. <laughs> I was. I was like, Lord Jesus, just take me now, take me to heaven, take me to heaven, Lord. You know? But I mean that's it's funny looking at the scripture because this makes me think that God has a sense of humor, right? Right. He has to, he had to give it to us. But I mean, he has to make sure that he came waddling out of the like he couldn't have done it himself. And that couldn't have, couldn't have left no doubt to the people that they tried to stage this, that Mary and Jesus all got together, and they're just doing this so that way we don't kill him. Um, but I find it interesting that they tried to kill him, and then that leads to them even killing him right after Lazarus is raised from the dead. That's whenever it goes into the plot to kill Jesus, and kind of who sets that up. So one of his last things was to show them that not only do I have power over sickness and disease, I have power over death. You know, and this was before we could go into heaven directly as death happened. You know, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, if that's where God put him. I don't know how that whole thing happened now. God might have brought him up to heaven and told Lazarus, sit here for a second. You're about to go back down there. It's going to be awesome. I, I don't know, and I don't really care, right? Some stuff people try to worry about, I, it doesn't matter to me. You know, people try to get real philosophical with the word, and then some of them get loopy and kick a Bible across the audience, right? Uh, that's right. You know, talk about, you know, Scripture talking about you, know, you have water here, it turns into ice, and then that turns into dry ice, and dry ice isn't even the same chemical that's in ice. Just looking dumb. Hawking loogies on people in front of the st t stage trying to talk about healing the blind man. I said that to my dad the first time I have, and I said, you never a hock a on me, I'm out of the church. I said, and secondly, we're going to be live streamed, and I don't know if I'm going to have the love of Jesus, I might hit you back <laughs> with a fist. And not, not, I can't do that. But it's just funny how people do it, and then you look at other, I, I look on you know, Instagram, I follow some, some things, and you follow other churches and where you can see the power of God moving, and it ain't really <coughs> as produced as some of these you know, teachers that are out here just pretty much trying to make money. You know, they're, they're, it's not a coincidence that Joel Osteen's church had gunshots in it. And it's not a coincidence that the devil could get into a place like that and, not, and you not be told, you know. That, that's not just something that happens. Um, so they better make sure that they stop worrying about what the world thinks about it and worry about what Jesus thinks about it. Amen. Right. Because we don't know when the day, the time, or the hour is, but every day that happens is closer than it was the day before. Amen. So now we're going to go, and we're going to finish up in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And this is going to be accounting uh, Mary, uh, Lazarus' sister. And this is before the Passover. So it's the next chapter over. It should be. Yep. Yeah. So this is after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus raised from the dead. And this is six days before he died. Because that's what, you know, the Passover happened and all that and plot and, and everything to kill Jesus. And it says that he, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. And Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wept, wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas, who was later to betray him, objected, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It, it was worth a year's wages. And he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Mm -hmm. So he wanted her to sell it so he could have took a little bit of that money. Why are you pouring all this out on Jesus' feet? Mm -hmm. But Jesus replied, and he said, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Amen. 
So right there, Jesus says, and he's telling them, it was saved for my burial, and they still don't know that he's about to die, that she's anointing him. So the one who came to him and said, if you would have been here, Lord, that Jesus wept in front of him, just raised her brother, she has the knowledge to know the Spirit has spoke to a woman to get him ready for burial. Somebody else she loves. And a lot of people say she's thankful because he raised Lazarus and all this other stuff. I think there's also a realization there that she's not only, you know, she got her brother back, but she's about to lose somebody she loved more than her brother. She's about to lose in the physical, natural sense, you know, her, her Lord and her Savior. And she's the one who chose to anoint his feet. Again, not a man, not anybody this, just somebody who just really loves him. So you got to have that heart to just really love somebody. I'm different than a woman 100%. If somebody doesn't, you know, want to have anything to do with me or anything, I can really just kind of cut that off. And I can just, I can just go... And I can just go about my life and just be like, they don't want to be a part of it. That's fine. I'm going to go here. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to do that. A woman, on the other hand, might have some feelings there, right? Harder to cut. That cut might not be just black and white. Like, all right, you go this way. I go this way. They might have some things they have to work through on that side. And that's the same thing with, you know, you have Mary here. Not Mary Magdalene who was sitting in the tomb and got to see him. But you have one Mary who's Lazarus' sister, gets him ready for burial. He goes through everything. And then another Mary who gets to see him when he's raised from the dead before he ascends to heaven. And what's the two traits that they have is the same trait that Jesus has for you is just how much they loved him. How much he loves you. If you just realize how much he loved you, she thought the worst thing she was going to face was losing her brother. And then she was hit with the reality, this is really worse than that. If somebody took your salvation, that's ten times worse than anybody in your family dying, anybody who you're closest to on this earth dying. Because like I said, at any moment that I get to see heaven step in, I'm gone. I ain't coming back. I don't care. I don't care if something happens and I have five children and one's a month old. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care if Marley's about to get married and I'm about to walk her down the aisle. If I got that chance in that moment to see heaven and go there, there ain't nothing in this world that is going to keep me from doing that. Amen. Because once you see Jesus, it, nothing else is going to matter. Mm -hmm. It's not even about heaven. It's not even about the things you're going to have. That's just good. Seeing him is going to trump it all. Mm -hmm. No pun intended on trump. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to, it's going to, you know, it's going to do whatever, whatever you need, whatever you thought you liked. It's not going to matter. You know, I, I everybody knows here. I, I like Georgia Tech, but I would. If it meant missing heaven, I wouldn't want them to win another championship. They could lose every game for the rest of my life if it meant I was getting into heaven. If that was a caveat, because it ain't even close. That's right. It, ain't, it doesn't even doesn't even fathom what what it's gonna be like. So that's what we have to realize is that this isn't, and that's kind of how the Lord helped me with the thing with you know Robert. It just finally it took. I mean, it took a while, but. And it's still, I'm, you know, you still process that stuff. But getting my mind to go from the reality to eternity. Because, I mean, there's just, there's so much more in eternity than what the reality is. Sure, miss him, want him, want him to be here. But knowing and the Holy Spirit really through prayer telling me that, you know, he ain't, he wouldn't want to be here. You know, even though, you know, I, I go to Disney World and I pick up Aria and I do this stuff. And, you know, I was holding her by the pool and a lady came up and said, she, you know, stopped us. And she said, oh, she said, you know, you see moms do this all the time. But you don't see dads cuddling little girls and, and hugging them to make them warm. This is just so, so precious. And, you know, Aria's face just lit up whenever the lady called, called me her dad. You know, oh. you know she just sitting there and I said, I said, can you believe she called me your dad? And she was like, no, I can't. <laughs> and I said, we must look a little bit alike since he's my brother. What do you think? She said, yeah, you do. <laughs> and then she, she jabbed me the next day when we were waiting at Peppa Pig. And we're going to go see, we're going to see Peppa Pig and Granddad Pig waiting in wait this line. We're first in line. And she looks up, the lady there right there, she looks up at me, pokes me in the stomach and said, 
your belly's as big as granddad pigs. <laughs> and I said, well, I appreciate that, but I don't think so. I don't think it's quite that size. Uh, but thanks for saying it in front of the worker. I appreciate you. Just say, and she ain't quite. She's laughing. I said, thanks for yelling that out to everybody. Now let's go up here. I said, I'm not hugging him because I'm not getting a picture beside him now. I don't, I don't want to be hit with that reality if it is, okay? So I'm going to stay down here. Y'all go up there. <laughs> but yeah, kids are, kids are funny. Kids are funny. Barley last night, I, it's hard because when I'm disciplining her, she's hilarious. She'll just, she's got her arms down and she'll just be like, I this and I don't remember. And then she'll just be talking about it. She'll just be like, oh, and I don't really know what I'm saying, but I'm saying. <laughs> so she lied twice to Courtney. She said she threw something away and she went and threw it in the room on the floor and then she said something else. So she's in there getting on to her about lying. And I come in there and, you know, for moral support. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm like, okay, Marley. Dad's done, you know, we're doing zero tolerance on these little lions because I hate lying. I said, so the next time you lie, um, you're going to get a whipping. I said, just first thing, the next time you lie, we're just going to go straight into you're getting a whipping. And <laughs> she turns and looks at me and goes, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I sat there. I said, before I hit this kid oh, in the head, right now, before I punt her against the wall, I said, okay. I said, you don't care? I said, you don't care? She said, I don't care. She said, she said, I don't care. And I said, all right, let me go sit my stuff down. I'll be back. And then Courtney's sitting there, you know, again, the feelings of the matter here, because I'm ready to go. Because I'm like, I'm like, I'm about that life, and she don't know it. <laughs> and then, so Courtney, Courtney's sitting there, she says, honey, do you realize what's about to happen? And she says, do you know what that means, what you did? I don't care. And she said, and then Marley talks to her, I think she said, she said, well, he said something about whipping, and I was just like, I don't know. And then she said, that's not what that means, honey, tell him I don't know, I don't care, it's kind of rude, disrespectful. Then I go in there, this whole time, she said... She said, well, my friend in class does it whenever we don't know something. So I just did it that way. And she said, I said, I said, so you're about to get a whipping right now. And then she starts crying like, I don't want a whipping right now. And I said, well, you don't understand what you're doing. I said, because you about got the worst whipping in your life. Shrugging your shoulders at me. And so we talked through it. And luckily, I didn't go off of my, you know, just get it done and just whipped her when she didn't understand what it meant. Because, I mean, she's funny, but she when she shrugged them shoulders, I said, my goodness. And then she's coming out explaining it, and the whole time we're talking to her, and she's trying not to laugh. Like, she's explaining to us, but she's trying not to laugh at us because she's getting in trouble. She'll be interesting to raise, I'll just say that. I can see some times, because there was times where Courtney was talking to her, and I'm hiding my mouth because I'm laughing at how she's explaining herself. But, I mean... The truth of the matter is, what? why was I going to whip her? Mainly it's because I don't want her to do that to anybody else. <laughs> I don't want her to be at school, and she's in school, and the teacher says, get this done, or I'm going to call the principal, and she says, I don't care. Because <laughs> let me tell you, if she ever does that, I'm going to tell them, you need to let me leave here so y'all don't call defects on me. Because yeah. <laughs> that's not, I, you know, that's not going to fly. But, you know, you got to teach her, so we had a long conversation, and I told her, when you can shrug your shoulders, when you can't shrug your shoulders, and because she's like, well, sometimes I shrug my shoulders, and y'all laugh about it, but now I can't shrug my shoulders here, and I said, well, you're young, and you don't know everything, and that's fine, you're going to learn, Own up. but that's kind of, you know, I say wrap this all around, is, is being a parent has kind of made me realize more about how much Jesus does love you, and why he punishes you for, well, not punishes, why he corrects you when you're doing things. Because he wants you to know what you need to do in situations, right? Right. Because that's an anything. If I never corrected that, she could get in front of a kid in middle school, do this, and get busted right in the face, right? Because that kid feels disrespected. So you're protecting them from the future. Yeah. You're correcting them so that way they can be better than what they are. But even in all that, even when and I say I whip her, I mean, I'm talking, this makes her cry, you know? Like... It ain't nothing. It's just this right here, and she just breaks down in a, in a puddle. Um, you know, but I don't even like doing that. 
I don't, you know, it's not something that I enjoy doing. Um, but uh, if you enjoy doing it, you might, you might be able to do some soul searching. You know, you know. <laughs> but I think my dad enjoys it a little bit sometimes, but he's saying now. A little bit. <laughs> but he enjoys it sometimes. Yeah. Uncle Keith was going to cut out my tongue once. Yeah. No, I wouldn't have enjoyed it. He wouldn't have enjoyed it. He wouldn't have enjoyed it. He did say, and I, I found that funny because I didn't really talk a lot. <laughs> But I must have been talking that day. I don't know what me and Donnie were doing, but it scared the scared everything out of me. I, that might have been why I didn't talk. Might have been that might have been it for five or you know for seven or eight years. That might have been why I was quiet. He said he was cutting the tongue out. I ain't having that happen. You know, we'd be sitting there and Donnie'd be doing something, and I'd be thinking in my head like, you know, you're about to get in trouble. And then he'd do it, and then he got in trouble. And then you, you know what's the funniest thing, and I'll end on here. The funniest thing is when you're a kid and you're over at somebody's house, whether they're related to you, cousins or not, and they get their tail tore up, and then they have to come sit back with you in the room, and you don't know how to break that ice. <laughs> they just got beat. You're sitting there playing video games, and they come in. They still have like some sadness. Try it's boys trying to be hard, you know, but they're hurting. And then you're like, don't really know what to say. And you're just like playing a video game or laying in the corner. And, they're just over there crying because if you say the wrong thing, they might get mad at you. And mm-hmm. It's just interesting. Don't be that. Don't be full of emotions. A yeah, it's a little awkward, but those, those are funny situations. Mm-hmm. Okay. When I'm at school, I kind of like when I used to like making them feel that way when I was a teacher. I did. Them little bad kids, I get them and I make them cry, and then I make them sit out in front of everybody and be like, "Hey, cry in front of them." Because you try to pick on all these kids in class, I was going to see you cry. <laughs> And I'd tell their parents that too, and then the parents would be like, they deserved it. These little these little kids, this kid's been mean to all these kids. And I was like, yeah, they did. I mean, certain ones, some of them are crazy, and I would just be like, I'm not talking to you, but we're just going to pray through it. But anyway, going back to the word, the scripture, all, all that. Just make sure, you know, in anything that you're always acknowledging what he's done for you, how much he loves you. And just having that heart to know where is he going to lead you and what has he said to you. And don't fall fall back from what he's promised you in the word. If you're holding on to something like healing, don't ever let it go. <clears throat> don't let it go. You know, if he promised you that you'll have five, you know, you'll be you'll be rich and not poor, hold on to that if you're dealing with situations in your finances. Whatever he's promised, he has to fulfill. So he has to come through in every situation unless we get to a place to where we stop. No matter how much it looks, if you stop that believing and you change your mindset, you automatically block what he can do for you in that area. So you always got to keep your mindset right. You got to keep your heart on him, how much he loves you, and just really believe that he wants to do it for you. Like he wants to do it for you. He, He did grand shows in the Bible. And he wants to do grand things now so that way people can believe that he is who he says he is. Because some people ain't going to believe that Jesus is real unless they see something miraculous. So you got to be the vessel to be able to do that, just believing on what he said. So if there's anybody here who needs any prayer, uh, rededicating your life, bad report from the doctor, sickness, disease, anything like that, would like to come up here and get prayed for, please raise your hand and put it back down. All right, if everybody's good, I'll just say a quick prayer and we'll finish up. Dear Lord Jesus, I just thank you and I praise you for this service. I thank you for this word. I thank you for your teaching. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us throughout this week into every area that we're doing. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood that it covers us and protects us from the things unseen, the things we don't know about. I thank you that you knew everything that would happen. And I thank you that you've already made a way. So I just thank you, Lord Jesus, right now for just speaking life into David's body, that he will live and he won't die. This cancer has to die. Whatever it is in him has to die. The doctors don't know. It has to dry up at the root. And I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word already promised us that you died for our sicknesses. You bore our sicknesses so that way we could live in health. And I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that whatever needs to happen in the situation will happen. And your will will be done in and throughout it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Is it too late for a credit report? No.